afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, seminar series, Legal Philosophy Between State and Transnationalism. Uh, today, we're uh, pleased to have one of our regular attendees, uh, Professor Stefan Skirafa uh, from McMaster University. Uh, Professor Skirafa has uh, a JD from the University of Texas and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Arizona. Uh, his research focuses on questions about uh, legal obligation, the normativity of law, uh, the law as a hermeneutical concept, uh, debates in general jurisprudence between positivism and natural law theory, uh, as well as legal reasoning and interpretation, so a vast range of topics uh, in legal theory. Uh, his work has been published in journals such as Law and Philosophy, uh, Legal Theory, as well as the European Journal uh, of Philosophy. Uh, he's also currently completing a book manuscript which has a title that's been kept well, well secret um, uh, with Rutledge, uh, of which I think this paper is going to be one of the, the, the chapters. What is the title of the, the manuscript? Well, we're, working we're working talking title? about that, uh, but it's the, uh, the nature of law. The nature uh, of law. Yeah, I, I want to say the nature of law and political morality, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, so today he's going to be delivering a paper uh, called Collectivist Authority, uh, it's Collectivist Structure and Juridical uh, Ground. So let me, welcome. Um, thank you, uh, let me thank you guys for having me out here, uh, Mike and Francois, uh, I'm really, uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity to present my material, Will could tell you that anytime I get a chance I try to corner, corner them, uh, talk about this stuff. Um, so, I'm, so I'm happy to present this, I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A session. Uh, as Mike mentioned, this is a chapter in a book where I'm defending uh, a particular uh, kind of theory of law, a non-positivist theory of law, and the theory of authority uh, figures uh, centrally in this account. If we have time at the end, I'm going to do a kind of application of the theory I defend here uh, that might, well, that will be suggestive of the uh, theory of law that might flow from this particular theory of authority. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, uh, about the broader project uh, or, or this, uh, of course, the paper that I'm going to present today. Um, so as you can see, the title of the paper is Political Authority, Its Collectivist Structure and Juridical Ground. Uh, let me just explain the title a bit to you and some of the main concepts to orient you. Um, so. Don't worry, this frontispiece from the Leviathan, from early editions of the Leviathan, is not going to be in all the slides. I have it here because I think it usefully <coughs> illustrates what I mean by the structure of political authority. So Hobbes, you know, famously has this idea of the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a political authority. And uh, the, the way you might think about this is that here's the head of the Leviathan. I don't think you can quite see this uh, from way back there, and I'm not even sure the resolution is good enough. But the chain mail of this Leviathan, uh, this Leviathan that's looming over the, you know, the Commonwealth here, uh, the chain mail of the Leviathan is made out of people. Uh, so the structure of political authority has to do with some sort of relationship between the head of the Leviathan, the deliberative body, and all the people. Uh, the Leviathan uh, uh, is able to bend uh, all these persons' uh, uh, actions to the Leviathan's will, and in so doing, uh, the Leviathan's able to create this gigantic, powerful being that can do all kinds of good things and all kinds of bad things. Uh, so the structure of authority, of political authority, as I understand it, has to do with the relationship between the head of the Leviathan and its constituent parts. Now, people make distinctions between uh, different kinds of authority. You might talk about charismatic authority. Uh, a charismatic authority would be an authority where the Leviathan gets these people to do what the Leviathan wants. Uh, by, uh, by just going around you know, their rational faculty, sort of bending to its charismatic will. Uh, uh, I could have put Donald Trump's face you know, right here, uh, uh, but, uh, but I didn't. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about quite. It's in the same ballpark, it's not the same thing. I'm talking about a rationalized kind of authority. And the idea is that the authority gives reasons are uh, to the to these folks, and uh, they act on those reasons, uh, uh, 
and thereby act in accordance with the authority's directives. Uh, when I'm talking, so when I'm talking about the structure of political authority, I'm talking about the structure of rationalized uh, political authority. Now, I should make a distinction between uh, what you might call uh, justified or legitimate political authority and de facto political authority, a kind of de facto political authority. In a de facto political authority, the head of the Leviathan is going to issue directives under the color of authority, saying, look, I'm giving you these kinds of reasons, now act accordingly, and uh, the, uh, uh, at least some of the folks, maybe a lot of the folks, accept that claim. Oh yeah, we have these reasons, we have to do this now. But they can all be wrong about that. You know, maybe the authority doesn't really give those reasons, though the authority pretends to. And maybe, so uh, he's not justified, nor are the people justified in accepting the authority. That's a possibility with the de facto authority. Uh, another, uh, right, you know, side by side with that, you can talk about a legitimate authority, which is he gives the reasons, uh, he, you know, he pretends to give the reasons, and he actually does give the reasons. And everyone's justified in accepting this relationship. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to discuss three different accounts of those reasons, you know, of what those reasons are that authorities pretend to give uh, 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 when, they make, when they issue directives, you know, to their subjects. Uh, I'm going to talk about the simple, the Rossian, and the collectivist conception. And the way they're going to differ is on the account of the reasons uh, that they give. Now, one thing that's important about this is once you get clear in mind what uh, the distinctive kind of reasons are that an authority get, uh, pretends to give its subjects, then that frames the question of whether it's actually justified in you know, issuing those directives and claiming to give those reasons. So if you have a different account of the kind of reasons, that's gonna lead to different accounts of the kind of grounds you need to ground the legitimacy or the, of, of the political authority, okay? So all these folks differ you know, with respect to the structural question, which also leads them to differ with respect to the grounding question. Now, what I'm going to do, uh, you know, as the first slide suggests, I'm going to defend uh, an account of the collectivist structure of authority, and I think that's going to uh, 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 come hand in hand with a juridical account of the ground of political authority relations. Okay, so let me first uh, discuss uh, what a simple, uh, what, you know, the simple account of relations of authority. A lot of folks, a lot of contemporary political philosophers rely on this simple account. Uh, uh, Alan Buchanan, Kit Wellman, A. John Simmons, uh, a lot of Americans actually, when they talk about authority, they have the simple view in mind. Uh, and they seek to justify this simple relationship, you know, this simple rational relationship. Uh, so let me describe what that is. So uh, in, in the simple relationship, let me just, there, there are fancy words that we use to demarcate you know, this account, but let me just kind of say it just more directly. Just imagine, uh, uh, you know, a captain of a ship saying, swab the deck. The idea on the simple account is that when the captain says, swab the deck, that itself is a reason to swab the deck that's distinct from your ordinary reasons, such as the deck's messy, it's my turn to swab the deck, uh, it's not my turn to swab the deck, uh, 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 the deck's clean, right? So you can distinguish between the fact that the captain says so as a reason in itself from these ordinary reasons. Now on the simple account, uh, a, a has authority over B only if A's directives are substantial, moral, content-independent reasons. Well, content-independent reason just is, that we, that's the fancy term that labels this idea that the fact that someone says so is itself a reason distinct from the ordinary reasons to do this, to do whatever the directed action is. Okay. Um, So, so, uh, so on one account, what authorities uh, characteristically claim is to give reasons of this particular sort. Um, now, famously, uh, Joseph Ross has an alternative account uh, of what this relationship is. This, you know, this relationship of reasons is. Uh, you know, on his account, the simple view is too simple. Uh, he adds a further Philip to the account. Um, to help you see uh, what this further idea is and what motivates it, first I want you to consider that content-independent reasons are commonplace. We give each other content-independent reasons all the time. If 
your partner asks you to do something, the fact that she asks you to do that thing is itself a reason to do that thing. That's the, or, you know, that's the, or, uh, that's my view. Anyway, we could uh, talk about that. Maybe, maybe someone would dispute uh, uh, whether content-independent reasons are quotidian in the way I'm suggesting. Uh, if your, uh, if your child asks you to do something, that's a reason to do that thing. Um, Stephen Darwall has a, uh, an example that uh, that's somewhat well known. Uh, if if you're stepping on someone's foot, and they ask you to remove your foot, the fact that that person uh, uh, to whom the foot belongs, asked you to remove, uh, you know, uh, your foot, that in itself is a reason, distinct from the ordinary reasons, like it's hurting me, or, uh, you know, I'd feel better if you took your, you know, foot off mine. Same thing with the, the you know, the request that you might make of, a, uh, uh, of your partner. The reason that you ask is distinct from, I'd really like it if you did that thing. It's, no, I asked you, and that itself is a reason all on its own. Okay. Now, something else I want to point out here in the context of authority is that these are content-independent reasons, but they're, they're content-independent reasons of a particular kind. They're substantial moral content-independent reasons, meaning they're weighty and they're grounded by some important moral consideration. So let's take Stephen Darwall's example. Uh, you know, I think this is the kind of story Stephen Darwall would give. He has a kind of Kantian bent. The idea is that basically the respect due to any human person, any rational agent, uh, requires, uh, grounds the content independent force of his request to get off his foot or her foot. Uh, the, just the, 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 the fact that they're a rational agent and they have a certain kind of dignity grounds the content independent force of their, re uh, of their requests in some domains, even demands in some domains. Uh, similarly, you might say, when you have a special relationship with a loved one, the, that, the, 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 the value of that relationship grounds the content-independent force of their requests that they might make pursuant to that relationship, as part of that relationship. Okay, so the idea is that in the case of authority, the authority's directives are content-independent reasons. Uh, they're, they have a substantial moral ground. But here's Raz's point. Uh, <coughs> There are a lot of uh, speech acts that are content-independent reasons like this. Um, but you know, at least intuitively, uh, requests and authoritative directives have a very different normative character. There's something distinctive about requests, that dis I mean, uh, uh, about authoritative directives, that distinguishes them from uh, requests and other speech acts that uh, are also substantial moral content-independent reasons. What is that further thing? What is that further character? Um, preemption. Uh, the idea is that not only is the fact that uh, the authority say do, say do, you know, say, says do this, a reason to do this, it's preemptive. It does something more. Um, in the Leviathan, chapter 17 of the Leviathan, uh, Hobbes describes how it is that we form the Leviathan, how a community forms the Leviathan. I have a little excerpt from that passage. I'm just going to read the last little bit uh, of it. Um, so this is what you do to form a Leviathan uh, with one another, a political authority and a political community. Every one to own and acknowledge himself to be author of whatsoever he that so beareth their person shall act or cause to be acted in those things which con concern the common peace and safety and therein to submit their wills. This is the distinctive character. To submit their wills, every one to his will and their judgments to his judgment. So the idea is that it's not just that this person's uh, directive is a reason. This person's directive, in a sense, replaces one's will or one's judgment. Now, Roz uh, uh, picks up on this. And Roz has this idea of preemption. He coins the term in the 20th century to, to you know, point out this distinctive feature of authority relations. He, he says, look, what we're looking for to distinguish authority relationships is the thing that's the truth in the saying that in accepting authority, we surrender our judgment to the authority. He's, you know, he's, he's echoing Hobbes, here. Con you know, fully self-aware, he's not quite right. Uh, so what Roz says is that here's how we need to understand that preemptive relationship. Uh, when someone has political authority over you, or if they claim it, 
this is what they claim. They have it, they actually have this thing that they claim. They claim that their directives are not merely another reason to be added to the balance by which the addressee will determine what to do. Rather, uh, the directive uh, is a reason on which to act regardless of whatever other conflicting reasons exist. Now here, Roz is introducing his idea of an exclusionary reason. An exclusionary reason is a reason not to act for certain reasons that remain valid and good reasons. So the Leviathan says, drive on the right side of the road. The Leviathan now gives you not only a reason in the fact that he, that he said drive on the right side of the road to drive on the right side of the road, he also gives you a reason not to allow considerations that would weigh in favor of driving on the left side of the road to inform one's deliberations any longer. Those reasons remain, they're still good reasons, but now you have this second order reason not to act for them. So, so in this way, Roz gives an account of the sense in which authorities exclude and replace they, uh, uh, the judgment or the will of their subjects. And that's what's distinctive of the authoritative relationship. It's not just one more reason to add up with all the others. It excludes and replaces uh, at least some of the countervailing reasons not to do as directed. OK. Um, now, so now Roz is going to criticize uh, the, sim uh, the simple conception of authority. Uh, Roz is going to say two things. First, the, the simple view theorists, people like Kit Well and Min, Alan Buchanan, A. John Simmons, here, they miss something really important about political authority. Uh, they fail to fully appreciate the texture of that relationship, the texture of the kind of special reasons that political authorities give their subjects. And that leads to a further problem, because of course all these folks want to find the grounds, the considerations that would justify that sort of relationship. Uh, and, but they're looking in the wrong place because they don't have a full account of what exactly the kind of reason it is that they need to justify. Uh, so the simple view also misdirects simple view theorists' inquiries into the considerations that might ground political authority. Uh, you need, the idea is that you need very different kinds of considerations to explain the, conf, uh, the exclusionary force, the excluding and replacing force of an authoritative directive than you would need to explain the uh, substantial moral content independent force alone. So let me make clear, the Rossian view agrees with the simple view that authoritative directives are substantial content independent reasons, but it adds that they're also exclusionary reasons. Okay, now, now let me turn my sights on the Rossian view, because uh, uh, you know, ultimately I'm, I'm gonna reject the Rossian view. And let me begin uh, with an account of why the simple view theorist might uh, be justified in rejecting uh, the Rossian view, uh, while even acknowledging that maybe Ross gets the phenomena, the social phenomena of the nature of authority relations uh, correct. Um, to, to motivate or to, to set the stage for this rejoinder to the Rossian view that the simple view theorist might mount, uh, consider these two circumstances of political authority. First, there's disagreement about one another's rights and duties. So here what I'm thinking is that one of the things authorities do is they, you know, they issue directives that basically specify the rights and duties of everyone, of all the subjects, all the constituent parts of the Leviathan. Um, so there's, so there's disagreement in the population about one another's rights and duties. Political authority's main task is to settle those disagreements by issuing and enforcing directives that specify the contours of its subject's rights and duties. Uh, so, so, uh, so we have these two circumstances in place. Here's my key point. Given one, subjects will find many of the authority specifications of this network of rights and duties objectionable. Let me give you a concrete example to sort of see this picture. One of the things that an authority is going to do, a political authority is going to do, it's going to set what the property rules are, you know, for this political community. And, that, and by doing that, they're going to, the, the authority is going to set what these various, you know, rights and duties are that constitute the property regime in this community. 
Well, given the facts of disagreement, people are going to disagree about the contour, what that property regime should look like. Um, and they're probably going to disagree, uh, you know, certainly going to disagree with at least significant aspects of whatever, whatever the political authority you know, settles on. Uh, so, so what's going to happen in these circumstances of political authority is that subjects we're going to find many of the authority specifications of these, say, property rules, as an example, uh, objectionable, maybe even deeply uh, objectionable. Okay. Now, the importance about, uh, of the simple view is that it, is it, it puts its finger on, or it, 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 it yeah, puts its finger on a certain kind of possibility, the possibility of dutiful obedience. So the question, uh, you know, a question you might ask is, well, given that I think these are bad property rules, uh, what are my reasons for going along with it? What are my, you know, how am I going to respond to the fact that I'm being forced to go along with it uh, by this powerful Leviathan? Well, one possibility is that you're going to, th your main reason, your main motivation that you're actually uh, uh, going to have or, or should have is this fear of the sanctioning power of this powerful being, the Leviathan. Um, Another main possibility is that you recognize, and you know, the apologists for political authority hope uh, are justified in recognizing the substantial moral content independent force of the authority's directives. I have a moral reason to do this that's distinct from all the reasons that, uh, uh, that you know, speak to the uh, suboptimal nature of these rules. So, so really, uh, what, what's important about justified authority is that it gives you a substantial more reason to go along with suboptimal rules. Um, so what the simple view does is, it, is it, it at least sets the frame for the possibility of dutiful obedience and an you know, inquiry into whether dutiful obedience is possible in, in this context, whether there are grounds for it, uh, as opposed to just this sub subjugating relationship. Now, uh, and here's the rejoinder to the, uh, to the Rawsian uh, view. Uh, what the simple view theorist is going to say is, look, the substantial moral content independent force of the authority's directives marks the distinction between subjugation and the possibility of dutiful obedience. And that's a big deal. That's a much better moral relationship to be you know, in this dutifully obedient relationship where that's a possibility, one's justified, than one where one's just uh, bending to the Leviathan's will due to fear of sanction. So it points out something really important about authority relationships. But here's the question. What does this little Philip, this idea that the exclusionary, that those, these, these ideas also have, that the, that the directives also have exclusionary force, what does it add? <coughs> What's morally important about that? Is that a moral improvement of my relationship? Is it important that I have that kind of relationship with the authority? That it actually does give me exclusionary reasons in addition to substantial moral content independent reasons? So here's the simple view rejoinder. We reject the Rossian view in favor of the simple view because the simple view focuses inquiry into the grounds uh, of authority uh, uh, where it's, it's focusing on the morally important aspects of that relationship. So the simple view theorists could even say, look, yeah, Roz, as a matter of a kind of quasi-anthropology, you're right. For some reason, political institutions insist on the preemptive force of their directives, but that's just not morally important. What really matters is that they give a substantial moral content independent reasons. OK. So now we have a kind of puzzle. And I've, I, I, I hope to have suggested it in that last concept. Ra, I mean, that last uh, little point that I made. Raz's observation that political institutions insist on the distinctive preemptive force of the directives seems right. At least it does to me as a matter of quasi-anthropological observation of these authority relationships. There's something distinctive about the directives of an authority as opposed to someone who's just making a request. But then here's the puzzle. Why would political institutions insist that in addition to being substantial moral content independent reasons, they are also, that, that, that its directives are also exclusionary reasons. Why aren't they content to insist on the overweening substantial moral, uh, con, uh, substantial moral content independent force of the directives? Why would they insist on preemption 
this extra thing. All right. Here's one possibility. Uh, so Alan Buchanan notes that something that authorities need to effectively govern uh, at, uh, without unacceptable costs is the recognition from the community of its, of its directive's preeminent standing vis-a-vis, -vis, yeah, 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 it's preeminent standing. So maybe the Rawlsian, uh, so, so, so the idea is that uh, in order to uh, govern uh, you know, by, by dint of perceived uh, a moral reason or by moral suasion as opposed to sanction, uh, uh, then the subjects of an authority uh, need to uh, 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 some, perceive somehow that, uh, that the authority's directives have some sort of distinctive normative standing. And you know, one thought might be, well, maybe that's what exclusionary reasons are. Maybe the, maybe the idea is that, oh, it's this exclusionary force that is this distinctive thing that the authorities need to be able to govern without un un unacceptable costs, to be able to coordinate uh, the subject's uh, actions, to bring them all you know, in accordance with one particular will uh, uh, without unacceptable costs. But once again, I think this same question, uh, a similar question arises. W why couldn't we, wh why isn't overweening substantial moral content and independent reasons enough? You know, uh, so what, what, what you need is for all these folks to do what you say. So why isn't it enough just to insist on the overweening and dispositive force of your directives? As opposed to, uh, uh, you know, saying that no, and they're also preemptive. They're also exclusionary reasons. All right. So the thought is, well, that's not going to help either. There's, there's, it, it still seems mysterious why the Rosians going to insist, or why uh, authorities would insist on the exclusionary force of their directives. Okay. I don't think that this is quite yet a criticism of the Rossian account, but it sets the stage, it at least gives us reason to pause. And here's what I think it motivates. I think it motivates uh, at least considering an alternative analysis of preemption that doesn't, where once you understand preemption in that way, you can see why authorities would insist on it. And you would also see what's morally important about it. Um, I think the collectivist conception is, uh, is, is, you know, delivers on that. The collectivist conception offers an uh, alternative analysis of preemption, and it also uh, uh, is, it, you can readily see why that it's morally important that uh, authorities, uh, directives are preemptive in this collectivist sense, and why they would insist on it. That's one of the main claims I'm gonna wanna make. I also have a second, uh, main line of critique of, the, of Rossi's account. Uh, but let's, let's, let, let's explicate uh, this collectivist idea. I'll try not to be like Mark Rubio up here. All right. Um, so you have two different models, I think, of political authority. Now, the way I'm understanding this is that, in essence, what you ultimately get when you have a political authority, you know, in this Hobbesian tradition that I think Roz has picked up on, uh, is a collective will of a sort. And I don't mean anything metaphysically robust or spooky about that. Here's, here's what I mean. That when you have a political authority, there's some sort of deliberative agent that has a will, and somehow, uh, 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 through reason, you know, rationally mediated, the, uh, the, the, that agent, the head of the Leviathan here, is able to give its subjects reasons to conform <laughs> to its will, at least within some delimited practical domain, a significant you know, uh, practical domain. So ultimately, uh, as this model suggests, this frontispiece suggests, uh, political authority is about a collective will, what it is, and you know, what, what kind of holds it in place, what kind of rational considerations hold it in place. Um, 
And I see two different models for this. Here's how I understand Ra Raz's model. I think Raz gives us a model of how this work works. His idea is that each individual in the collective, each little constitutive part of the Leviathan here, allows the uh, head of the Leviathan to exclude and replace you know, their, uh, his or her will in the relevant domain. Uh, now, when a lot of people do this with respect to the same agent, the result is a collective will. Because you know, now they all have reason to do exactly what, this, you know, what the Leviathan says, and all the reasons not to do it are excluded and replaced by the directive. So you get this construction of a collective, uh, collective will through exclusionary reasons. Um, now I call this uh, dyadic and individualist because the way this works is that there's a dyadic, a fundamentally dyadic relationship between each component part where the, where the authority gives each one a reason that excludes and replaces each individual will considered separately, right? Okay, so, that, so dyadic's uh, this, you know, uh, uh, this relationship, it's, you know, it's two people, and there's this kind of relationship between that two, between that pair. And it's individualist because what you're doing is you're replacing the will of each individual taken separately. Now, the collectivist model. I think it's a different model of political authority and what this rational relationship is. Each individual in the collective accepts that there should be a collective will for the relevant community in some practical domain, that everyone should be on the same page in some practical domain. And they converge with respect to the age, with respect to the agent, that they each think uh, uh, should specify the terms of that collective will. So the idea would be like, okay, we all see that we need some scheme of property rules. Uh, now, uh, uh, we're gonna create, a, a, we, we, the authority is gonna be the agent whose specification of those property rules is the one that we all must follow. Uh, that's the fundamental idea that's, uh, of the collectivist model. There, there's this, at, 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 the build, at, the, at the fundamental level of this model, there's this idea of a collective and this idea of the need for a collective will. Now I try to, I take a stab at trying to, you know, persistify what this looks like what kind of reasons these are. And um, my persistification of what kind of reasons these are on the collectivist model, it doesn't use Ross's device of exclusionary reasons. It doesn't need it. Uh, um, let me make uh, one more point, and I think this is crucial. Um, on this collectivist model, there's an alternative notion of preemption our surrender of judgment. On this collectivist model, each member of the collective surrenders judgment in the sense that each accepts that the Leviathan's will, rather than the will of any of the Leviathan subjects, uh, ought to specify the terms of the collective will. Uh, now that's very different than accepting that the Leviathan's will ought to exclude and replace her individual will. So they surrender judgment in the sense that they accept that the Leviathan's will should set the collective will, as opposed to uh, as opposed to accepting that the Leviathan's will should exclude and replace my own individual will. All right. So now here's my attempt at the persistification. A has authority over Group G only if there's a non-empty set of directives uh, such that A should issue any of them. That's the collective will, by the way. Uh, uh, the, the set of directives. It's not an empty set of directives. Uh, 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 that, uh, so the idea is that s s such that A should issue any of them. For each member of G, here are the two things. The directive would be a substantial moral content and independent reason. That's basically the simple view. And then B, and this is the stand-in or the analog to exclusionary reasons uh, on the Rossian account. The substantial moral content independent force of that directive would both defeat, without being defeated, by the substantial moral content independent force of any countervailing directives that the members of a group G might issue. So the Leviathan says, here are the property rules, and uh, some of the subjects might say, yeah, but these property rules are better. 
well, uh, the Leviathan's directives are authoritative if the, con the reason to follow uh, the Leviathan's directives defeat the reason to follow any of the, uh, the content independent force of the uh, other members of the public's directives, taken singly or in combination. All right, so that, this, is the f this is my attempt at trying to persistify this collectivist idea that plays an analogous role to Ross's exclusionary reasons. All right, so you have a fundamentally collectivist surrender of judgment. Now, now I can say a little bit about the importance of collectivist preemption. Uh, remember a while ago I said that more con substantial moral content independent reasons are a dime a dozen. Um, and so you, know, you imagine that, okay, here's this crew of folks, they all know they need to agree uh, to some property regime or another, they all have conflicting views about you know, what that should look like. Uh, now, here's a worry. If the Leviathan claims my directives are substantial moral content independent reasons, the, the, the worry is that, wait, what's different? You know, everyone's directives here. All of these folks are uh, people with dignity and their you know, fundamental interests are implicated by these property rules, what they're gonna be. Everyone's views about how we should uh, specify our, uh, uh, our property rules are substantial content independent reasons. The fact that any of us want this is itself a reason. It's true for everybody. So the Leviathan needs to tell a story about how its directives are distinct, how they stand out in this sea of competing substantial moral content independent reasons with respect to, say, these property rules. And so what the Leviathan's gonna say is that, well, the substantial moral content independent force of my reasons defeats the force of all of your reasons, singly or combined. Mine stands out. Uh, uh, I'm gonna avoid any Trump references at this point. Uh, uh, but, but the idea is that this content independent reason is more powerful than anybody else's substantial moral content independent uh, reason. That's what it is to insist on uh, the preemptive force of, of the political authorities directives. Okay, ooh. So collectivist preemption uh, is preeminent uh, standing. Political institutions insist on it because they need it to govern at acceptable costs. They need to give everyone a moral uh, a reason that uh, defeats the moral reasons that everyone else's conflicting views might give in, in the governed community. Um, because that's botched, I'm not even going to deal with that. Uh, we, we can come back to this. I also have a little point about why it's morally important uh, th that we have this relationship to the uh, authority as opposed to just a mere substantial moral, you know, just a simple relationship to the authority. Let, let me just drop that for the sake of time, but we can come back to it if you'd like. Okay, so now I've given you an account of collectivist pre preemption uh, and collectivist authority. I think one point in its favor over the Rossian account is that it explains why, uh, why political authorities would insist upon it. It's not a puzzle any longer why political authorities would insist on the preemptive force of their directives. Um, but I think there's a more powerful argument to be leveled against the Rossian account. But to get to that, I have to quickly describe the grounds of collectivist authority. Um, what I take to be the key juridical ground. The, as I see it, it uh, if you have this collectivist account of the structure of political authority, that invites uh, what's referred to as a functionalist defense uh, of political authority. Now what functionalist defenses do is you know, the, 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 the main move that kind of you know, unites this school is they say that the key basis, the key consideration that grounds uh, the political authority of an institution is its ability to coordinate uh, its, its members, uh, uh, coordinate their efforts to realize you know, very important goods. So the thing that might justify uh, 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 political institutions around here is their ability to coordinate our realization of a commonly observed scheme of property rules. And there are all kinds of goods that come with that. Um, uh, now, 
I want to offer a variation, a particular variation on this functionalist account. And the term I'm going to use, instead of coordination, the term I use, but they're roughly interchangeable, is this idea of a public settlement. Um, a public settlement is it's just a, it's a sim, it's a simple idea. And we see it all the time. Uh, anytime, say, a court makes a decision, but anytime a legislature, for example, issues laws about, say, property rules, a public settlement is uh, realized when the members of some group conform to the same standards of common uh, of conduct. We all follow the same property rules, for example, and they're also mutually aware that everyone's following the same rules. And they could at least quickly come to learn the content of those rules if necessary. So you know, a judge will make a decision about some legal dispute, and that will create a new public settlement for the community about you know, what that little disputed bit of rights uh, you know, is for the community. And everyone will observe it, and everyone will know what it is. They'll be able to look it up. A legislature might do the same thing with property rules. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll specify what the property rules are around here, and that will establish kind of public settlement. Now, one of the key ideas is that some public settlements, and uh, a lot of folks have argued, and I would join them, uh, are morally mandatory. Meaning there are certain kinds of public settlements that all of us have to follow if they exist. So uh, around here, there's a network of property rules. And there are substantial, defeasible, and that's important, moral reasons to conform to the property rule settlement around here. And this isn't, uh, this isn't anything novel, but I should at least point them out. Uh, there are various reasons why uh, we might be morally bound to all kinds of public settlements. Uh, two that are well known, you know, uh, from the arguments that Hobbes or Kant might make are agency and security interests. Uh, first, talk about the security interests. If we settle what the property rules are around here, you know, what belongs to whom, what rights people have to external objects, and that sort of thing, there are gonna, there's going to be a lot less violence if that's just settled. And everyone follows the same norms and knows what the rules are, and there's general conformity. Um, also, if there's a settlement of this sort around here, uh, certain very important agency interests will be realized. Uh, you know, we rely on people observing certain property rules to make long-term plans. You know, I need to know if my house is still going to be something I can get access, you know, throughout the day. I need to know if I'm going to have rights to this field that I've just plowed that will be observed by everyone, uh, if, it's, if I'm going to be justified in culling it, uh, in plowing it. Um, similarly, if I'm going to try to cooperate and in, in, enter into fruitful interactions, you know, economic and financial transactions with others, that requires a background public settlement of all kinds of rights and duties when it comes to these various uh, objects of property. So the idea is that there are really powerful moral grounds for conforming to certain kinds of public settlements if they exist. Um, I'm not going to say much about fairness. Uh, maybe, uh, we, I'm happy to talk about it. But I will say a little bit about democratic pedigree. Something that's interesting about democracies is that, you know, of course, democracies will settle these rules for folks, you know, say property rules for folks. And when they do, you'll have these agency and security interests to conform to their settlement. But there's something there, you'll have a further interest as well to conform, or a further reason to conform to their settlement, to, to their settlements as well. Namely, uh, there'll be this moral value of equal respect for the say of everyone in the community about what those rules are that will tether you to those, that particular settlement. So any deviation from the settlement uh, would, you know, would upset those democratic considerations. Now, I don't mean this as an exhaustive list of the reasons that would ground uh, the moral mandatory force of a public settlement, but I think this captures you know, the big ones. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that. OK. So I offer something that I call the normal functionalist justification thesis. Uh, and, 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 and it pretends to be an account, a functionalist account of the grounds of a political authority. And it requires like two parts. First, this institution that you know, is a candidate of authority, the issuance, its issuance of directives has secured 
I would be likely to secure the realization of a morally mandatory public settlement for a group, like the property rules. Second, and, and the second part is key, because this is what grounds the, the preemptive, the collectivist preemptive force. All things considered, that political institution's issuance of those directives is better than any alternative feasible mortality for that group to realize the settlement. So let me just give you an easy example, I, I, uh, hopefully an easy example. So think of the case of judicial review. Judges are in kind of a unique position. So here's some property rule that the legislature had, the Democratic legislature has, you know, wants to institute. It's a statute. And in countries where judicial review is an observed practice, the judge is in a position of, you know, potentially overruling that statutory settlement on, say, constitutional grounds, or allowing the legislature's directive to secure and specify the settlement. Uh, the idea is that uh, the legislature would have authority in that case, and not the judiciary, if the legislature was the better modality for achieving that settlement, and vice versa. In that case, those would, those would both be feasible modalities for achieving the settlement, but the, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the better all things considered modality would be the one that has authority in that case. Uh, uh, assuming that its directives could achieve uh, uh, this public settlement, that it, that it could uh, secure that public settlement for the relevant group. So, so let me make, so let me, with, hopefully that's reasonably clear. I think it'll come, it should become even clearer when I now turn to Roz's account and uh, and give a quick critique of it. Uh, and I think, hopefully this will bring out at least the gist of this normal functional, functionalist justification thesis that I've described. Okay, so, Braz offers a functionalist defense of authority in some places. Uh, the most, the, in his early writings, he put this very baldly, very directly, and I think this is just a, a, a rare case where the argument is transparently weak. So here's what he says uh, in Practical Reasons and Norms. That dates, actually, for a, a revised edition. So here's what he says. Authority can, can secure coordination only if the individuals concerned defer to its judgment and do not act on the balance of reasons, but on the authority's instructions. Okay, this guarantees that all will participate in one plan of action. That action will be coordinated. Okay, now think about this. So what Roz is saying is that the only way the authority can coordinate the, the whatever it is, the, the public settlement in question, is if everyone in that group takes its directives to be exclusionary reasons. Um, and for that reason, everyone in the group should take its directives as exclusionary reasons, because of course they want to achieve this public settlement, assuming it's a good thing, it's like instituting a public settlement with regard to property, role, uh, property rules around here. Okay, now here's my question, here's my thought. Uh, that's transparently false. Right now, in Canada, uh, the government is securing a public settlement with respect to the property rules around here and a whole bunch of other rules. I, I, mean, you know, I haven't done uh, you know, sociological investigation or you know, send out surveys or whatever you might want to do, but I'd be very surprised that uh, if everyone here was treating those directives as exclusionary reasons, and that's how we were maintaining that particular public settlement. More pointedly, there's, there are a lot of ways to maintain public settlements, uh, and you know, my claim is that, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that, leave it at that. Uh, so, so the idea is that, look, this argument that this functionalist consideration on its own could ground the exclusionary force of an authority's directives just seems transparently implausible. All right. Now that's not a novel point. 
Leslie Green makes a very similar point in a, in a series of arguments. And as far as I can tell, it looks to me like Roz has basically conceded this point. Because now what Roz says is that, well, it's this capacity to coordinate in tandem with the, the authorities, the, the state's expertise with respect to certain values that are relevant to when and how to coordinate that ground the exclusionary force and hence the authority of its directives. So now what Roz says, and he has several passages like this, if the person or organization is less likely to be biased than I am, and if they have greater expertise than I concerning the goods and social needs for which coordination may be needed, say a regime of property rules, and the ways of achieving them, in such a case, I should adopt a rule to follow the instructions of such a person or body to regard them as authorities. And by that, he means exclu uh, you know, source of exclusionary reasons. And his idea, the reason he brings in, brings in this idea of expertise or lesser bias is because, uh, is because if the authority has greater expertise or lesser bias with respect to the reasons that uh, support having, say, a settled property regime, then his idea is that, well, then its directives that balance those reasons should exclude and replace the directives of the people with you know, greater bias or lesser expertise. Okay. Now, I think once we get this full picture in place, we see a perverse implication of the Rossian account uh, that I think makes the case for the collectivist conception. Um, so now let's imagine, I'm sure there's a lot of folks that do property law here, uh, uh, maybe not in the audience, but here in this law school. Uh, or let's imagine, you know, you know uh, folks like Jeremy Waldron, uh, Richard Epstein, who have significant, devoted significant parts to their professional careers. It is, uh, these folks, probably say with respect to property law, have, it'd be hard to argue that they have any lesser expertise. Uh, and, you know, let's just, and, and you know, uh, I, I would grant that at least some of these experts aren't any more biased uh, than the government institutions that legislate property laws. Now, here's a funny implication of the Rossian account. The authoritative directives, the, the, assuming that some institution satisfies the normal fu functionalist justification thesis, that is, they're the best modality uh, 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 institutional modality for securing and specifying the property rules around here. Uh, for the Rossian account, that modality, say Canada, would be, might be authoritative for some of us, but not the experts. And that's because, and the reason it wouldn't be authoritative is because there's no basis for excluding and replacing the wills of the experts. You'd have to find some basis for doing that. And I think that's a perverse implication. I think that's just one argument too far. You know, once you've shown that the institution is the best in possible institutional modality for specifying and securing this public settlement, you don't need to then look on a case-by-case -case basis to see if it has authority over particular in individuals. So here's the summary. The Rossian conception misguidedly defines the limits of political authority in terms of considerations that would justify the authority's performance of a deliberative function for each individual member of the public considered separately than for the authority's uh, uh, public as a whole. So, so here I think we have two models, and I think I've given arguments to recommend this first model. What's the primary task of political authority? Is it to set the collective will, you know, in a reasoned way? Or is it setting each subject's individual will, and thereby constructing a collective will. Uh, I think it's a mistake to uh, think that uh, whether, uh, whether an uh, agent has authority and, and to, to, to specify the scope of an agent's authority uh, in terms of the considerations that would ground it excluding and replacing each individual member's judgment. Rather, what we need is considerations that speak to whether it is the best modality for specifying uh, uh, the collective will for the whole. All right. I have an application, but I'm not, I've, I've definitely run out of time. Uh, but maybe we can discuss the application uh, of this idea. Let me point out just a, one more thing. So I have 
I, I've described this ju functionalist justification as the normal functionalist justification. And of course, Ross famously has the normal justification thesis. What the normal justification thesis is designed to do, that's his account of a normal grounds, um, you know, normal situation in which an authority is justified. What the NJT is designed to do is to show that individuals have a reason to allow the authority's judgment to displace their individual judgment with respect to the matter at hand. And I think that's a mistake. What the NFJT tries to do is try to find grounds that show why the authority is an authority in the sense that its directives should, it has the greatest normative standing to set the collective will for the group. It's the best institutional modality for setting the collective will for the group, for specifying the terms that all of us have uh, reasons to follow as opposed to someone else's views about what to do within the group. All right, thanks for that. I've gone a little bit over. Thank you very much. So we've now got uh, 45 minutes or so for, for questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a, a cue. So uh, if you see me staring at you, it's not because I'm you know, staring at you to, to, to look at you for any particular purpose beyond getting your hand so I can, I can put you in the queue. Uh, I always forget to say that in seminars, so some people know how it works and others don't. So if you have a question, just uh, let me know and I'll uh, signal. The second thing uh, is to make sure to wait for a microphone, uh, not because we need to make uh, your questions louder, but just for recording purposes. So, um, okay. So, Katrina, Francois, and Danny. Um, so my question is about that implication that you had. I don't yeah. know if you want to go back to this. Oh, yeah, side, I'm happy to. Uh, where you said, well, if you're an expert in settling property law, then, then you know that the authorities' directives will not be like will not be likely better than your own re, um, balancing of reasons. And so then you wouldn't have any reasons to obey the authority. To, yeah, to exclude and repress. Right, right. Yeah. So On to the treat, conception, you okay, do, yes. but yeah. So right. you, to, to treat them as exclusionary. That's and right. then I think I remember that when in, in authority and justification, after uh, Ras talks yep. about the normal justification thesis, he takes this little root away and says, but now some people might say that you need de facto authority in order to have legitimate yep. authority. Yep. And then he says something like, he doesn't really say whether he agrees, but he says something like in the direction of agreeing because he makes this point that unless you already have the power, people are not going to do what you say. And if they don't do what you say, you can't, like, because it's a service conception, you yep. can't provide them with the service. That's right. So you need the de facto authority yep. in order to have, yep. that's what I took it to mean. You yep. need the de facto authority in order to have legitimate authority. Yep. 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 Now, right. right, so now wouldn't that fill out that problem? Wouldn't, couldn't you say something like there, he has given you the answer to this specific implication because even if you're yep. an expert, you won't have de facto yep. authority, so you still have more yep. reasons? Yeah, I think the, on his account, the de facto authority, that bit about the de facto authority, it's a necessary condition of being a political authority, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to point out, that, okay, yeah, now I have reason to do with this what the Leviathan says, but I don't have an exclusionary reason. And on the Rossian account, unless the directive is also an exclusionary reason, it's not an authoritative reason. Did, did that, that's but that's a key point, so that's worth discussing. I, I'm allowed to follow up? Oh, that, the luxury of this. <laughs> okay, but so then in, in, I mean, in the same, in the same article, he then talks about how we need rules for co coordination yep. and does something like that. Yep, yep. He, he has a functionalist thing. account. So, the, so wouldn't those two together give you, give even the expert a reason to treat the authorities' reasons ex as exclusionary? And so if you bring them and bring those two considerations together, you get something like very similar to your... Yeah, and but my point is, is it's perverse to say that only if the authority has greater expertise than the particular subject is it authoritative. You know, if you bring, if you have to bring both of them together, then you're going to say for those subjects for whom you can't bring both of them together, I uh, mean, and, and by both of them, I mean the coordinating capacity and the relative expertise. Uh, so what Roz has to say is with respect to those subjects, the authority is not authoritative. You know, famously, Roz gives, and he acknowledges this, he gives a piecemeal account of authority. 
it's dyadic. You know, you have it over each separate person in the public. Uh, and the, the point is that the fact that the, coordinate, the authority can coordinate isn't enough for us. Uh, uh, he, it, he has to have some other consideration that shows that those directives are also exclusionary reasons, that they exclude some of the reasons of the individual subject. That's the point I'm trying to make. Have I answered your question? Uh, yeah, and if we, I come we can up talk with later. something new, I'll come back and annoy yep. you with it. No, excellent. It won't be annoying. I'm going to abuse my authority and just follow up on that. Sure. I want to ask. So I, I thought what you take to be a, a, a perverse implication to be you know, an insight Yep. Or uh, sound or true or strength of his view. Yeah. So you can imagine him saying, well, the law claims or through its institutions, it claims general authority over all, all of its subjects. Uh, but despite that general claim, you know, one thing that, um, you know, positives take great pleasure in doing is showing how the claims of law or the promises yeah. of law yeah. turn out to be yeah. to be false. Right? Yeah. The law might promise to be moral, but it might, yeah. might not be. So I can imagine Raz saying, well, the law might claim general authority over yeah. all subjects, but yeah. the strength of the piecemeal account is that the authority actually, in fact, yeah. may only be particular over particular people. So, I, I mean, I always thought that was a strength, yeah. view, not, not perverse. Yeah, yeah no, I, I see that, and it's hard to argue at this intuition, intuitional level. But let me just try to uh, just illustrate it. I mean, so what the, the implication is that uh, you, maybe some of the folks you know, in some uh, community will be authoritatively bound because they have lesser expertise or lesser bias, I mean, uh, I mean greater bias and lesser expertise uh, by these directives that secure something really important. And others won't be under the scope of the authority, like Jeremy Waldron or Richard Epstein. And that just seems bizarre to me. It seems to me that they, they do, they, they're under the scope as well, they should follow that institution's directives because it's the best modality available to us for uh, uh, securing and specifying the terms of the settlement. But the, the, let me but try this, another one. Let me try another because I. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. But I mean, take take the criminal law for example. Yeah. So take a uh, a legal directive against against yeah. murder. I take that norm yeah. in our criminal code not to have authority over me, given that I don't need no. to have it replace my judgment. Yeah. But that doesn't mean. That I'm not under an obligation not to murder, right? I'm still that's bound right. by that that's norm, right. that's but it doesn't have authority over me because I, yeah. I take it that most of us could, yeah. could sort of accept the norm against murder without needing to have our judgment yeah. reflection replaced. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, though that seems yeah. right. I, I don't see that the whatever problems the collectivist conception or the Rawlsian conception would have are really different with respect to that particular issue. Um, but I, okay. I, I, let me mention one other, because I have another illustrative yeah. example that, that, that kind of helps. So a lot of folks argue that authority can be grounded uh, on the basis of the democratic pedigree of an institution. Now, one debate that's raging right now, oh, raging, there's one article, is, is, whether, uh, <laughs> is, whether, is whether the democratic authority is somehow able to ex ground exclusionary reasons by virtue of its democratic pedigree. And so there's this very arcane debate about, well, are, does it ground exclusionary reasons or just really powerful content independent reasons? If you're a Rosian, that that arcane debate has implications for whether democracies are authoritative or not. And so my thought is, wait, that's the perverse way to draw the boundary. Uh, the, the way to draw the boundary would be like, look, does the democratic pedigree give that content independent reason preeminent standing in the community. And that's all you need to show. You need to show that it also is exclusionary reasons. I just want to follow up on that. That's okay. yeah. So how generalist is your account, right? There are other big figures in political theory who've come up with accounts of authority grounded in coordination, right? So mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking of Kant. The unnatural will is kind of this. He yeah. doesn't frame it in terms of authority. He might not frame it in terms of yeah. preemptive reason, yeah, yeah. but it's a very similar account. Yeah, there are a fact, lot of functionalists out there historically. But it got, and, and Finnis is one of them too, yeah. right? So Finnis yeah. says coordination is the be all yeah. and end all. Again, preemption yeah. might not be No, no, he, he wants but, exclusionary reasons. He, he accepts Ross's view. So, 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 and, so, but these are all prima facie general, generalist accounts, right? So you can't distinguish between individuals. 
And yeah. it's the system as a whole, right? Finna says the law is a seamless yeah. web yeah. as a result. Yeah. Is that the kind of yeah. outcome of your uh, of your account? Or you could say as yeah. between directives, not like between people. Yeah. Some of some of these directives might be authoritative, some yeah. might not be. Definitely. So, so that's that's yeah. okay. So you're less of a generalist than Finnis would be. Uh, that's right. Yeah. No, okay. I I am definitely, and this is a, something I should a key point I should make. The authorities' directives are substantial moral content, independent reasons, but they're defeasible. Right. And they can be defeated, and so there, there are ways in which the authority might overstep its claims or you know claim more authority than it has. Right, no but, doubt about but, it. But those would be for Finnish too, right? Yeah. Finnish is still yep. a prima facie. Yep. So, so in yep. a sense, the yep. outcome is pretty much the same, right? Uh, so, so how would you defer from his view? You would say, well, you ground your account in different values, perhaps, right? So he has the common good. You have oh, agency, yeah. security, yeah, fairness, yeah. and democratic, yeah, yeah. democratic pedigree. But yeah. you know, so so how is the, this insight not already contained there? Oh, I see. So, so is your question, how is, is your question? I'm, I'm just wondering if that work hasn't already been done. I yeah. Mean, it's a, yeah. <laughs> well, so. here's one thing. Finnis does, Finnis, at least he's officially committed to uh, Raza's structural account. Right. And if I'm right, unless Green's right about what functionalist accounts can do for you, then, uh, th then he, he has to drop that. Uh, but I also think what this account does is it, it, it gives a diff, uh, an alternative account of preemption. And that isn't in Finnis, because he has the exclusionary account. And that's an important feature, this preeminent standing. It's not just enough to show that the authorities' directives are substantial moral content independent reasons. Those are a dime a dozen. You have to show that something makes them preeminent, able to defeat without being defeated by all the competing considerations. And, that, and I think that's the contribution. Like you, need to, you need to now find grounds that make the, these directives stand out relative to the sea of content independent reasons out there. And, that is, and then you get a novel account of the ground, which is the NFJT. No one's, that's new. Certainly the second prong. Uh, Danny's next. So, do we have so I think I, I, I'm generally quite sympathetic to, to many of the things that you said, and, and some of the weaknesses that you raised in RAS are ones that I accept. <laughs> um, so, but my question is sort of perhaps not so much on the details, but on the overall, the yeah. bigger picture. Yeah. And, and it is this, so, so Raz, it seems to me, moved from a sort of what looks like more conceptual analysis of, of authority to more um, political theory of authority. And, and in the beginning of, you know, if, if you want to do a little bit of Raziology, then in the beginning of Practical Reason and Norms, he says this book is largely a book of conceptual analysis. And then in Morality of Freedom, he says this book <laughs> There are great limits to, to yeah. conceptual analysis. This book is more about political yeah. theory. Um, and, and so I wonder if, if actually the logical step is to say uh, the right way to think about this is to start with political theory and, and an account of authority will emerge from it. Yeah. So you ultimately have a certain political authority uh, or political, yeah. sorry, political philosophy that you subscribe to, which means authority is justified when yeah. it makes our lives better in one yeah. way or another, agency, yeah. Um, yeah. security, and so on. Yeah. Um, suppose you started, you started with that. You, yeah. you started with a political, and, and I would argue, by the way, that that's actually what you find in Hobbes, that, yeah. that Hobbes derives an account of authority from, from his political philosophy. Yeah. And so, my question to you is whether you are not, you wouldn't benefit yeah. from this. And here's one way in which this might yeah. come out. Um, some political philosophers might not be functionalists in the sense that they might not want to yeah. accept that the basis of political authority is this, mm -hmm. you know, makes our life better story. Mm -hmm. um, and then they will, what, they will not want to accept, I think, the rest of your story. So to make this slightly more concrete, um, perhaps some Republicans, not Republican 
you know, political Republicans might say the basis of authority is not necessarily that it makes our lives better, but that we make our own decisions. Some yeah. some idea of self government. Yeah. Um, and and then they might want to develop an account of authority that's that's not functionalist in this way. And so, yeah. To get to my question, <laughs> um, aren't you doing things in the sort yeah. of or, or yeah. wrong order? Yeah. Shouldn't you start with political yeah. philosophy and so? Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to be imperialistic about this, but. Uh, uh, I let me at least ex defend the approach that I'm taking, and I, I think I just get this from Roz, but I'm very sympathetic to it. Um, I think conceptual analysis is the way to go, but I, I probably have a broader idea of what's entailed by conceptual analysis, because <laughs> I would include what Roz's later work as exercises in conceptual analysis. So my th and, and as another aside, maybe this is a little bit of the Hegel stuff that I did in grad school. The idea is you you start with institutions as they are. And you look at these relationships, uh, and you know, and the the, the 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 at least the inchoate understandings of uh, of the participants in the relationships, what they think they're doing, uh, and you try to make sense of that. You try to rationalize that. I think that actually is conceptual analysis. But here's what I don't take myself to be doing, because there's something more than just merely like going out with a survey and like asking all these people questions. That you know, you, you look at the totality of what they say and what they do and how they act. And you try to give a rationally reconstructive account of, you know, of, a, of, a, of a concept that can make sense of all of that. I think one key feature of the phenomenon, I, I would say things like this personally all the time, is something like, oh yeah, that's not a decision for me to make, that's a decision for the department as a whole to make, that's a decision for you know, the city council to make. That's preemption, that's a surrender of judgment. And, then the, and I think people say things like that all the time, and then the question is, okay, how can we make sense of that? Can we precisify that in a way that then we can build, then go to work on trying to identify considerations or grounds of a relationship like that? So that's my, my thought. I also think that this story that I've given can fold in a, a lot of what at least Republicans might say, uh, because there's all kinds of goods that might be realized. Uh, uh, in these public settlements. And one of them might be some sort of Republican self-governance itself. That might be a constituent, fe constituent feature uh, uh, of the goods realized by these public settlements. That's a lot. Well, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm not sure that they would want to see self-governance, self-government as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, as a, yeah as a good, as a, as, a, as a goal in, I mean, well, maybe, maybe a regular he is a goal. consequentialist pedant, so I, I, I don't know, to be yeah. honest, so. Okay. I'd want to tell a story like that. And one of the reasons why a democratic public settlement is important is because you get some sort of non-subjection government, non-subjugating non government there, governance where everyone's gotten an equal say, and it prevents this kind of domination. Okay. Uh, John. Um, I, I, uh, overall, I think you that, that your account satisfies me more than the, the description, at least Roz as you've described him. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I, what I'm struggling with is some of the stuff that I, 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 it's probably not your stuff, it's probably stuff that you feel you have to deal with. Um, and it's the, um, a couple of phrases that, I, that are troubling, sure. e exclusionary, right? This, yeah. th this, that, the use of that word reminds me of theological discussions. Okay. You know, that, that you know, the question is whether, is one will acting or two will, are two wills acting, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, that kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the, the, the examples that I could give would, which where exclusionary would be the right word are things like, you know, like I'm going to be unconscious for a while and I'm telling the surgeon yeah. what to do because yeah. I'm not going to have a will for that period of time. Yeah. But that's not the ordinary calculation that people do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll, I'll, I'll return to this. So I, 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 I'm thinking exclusionary is probably not the right word. You're, the, the word surrender seems to work better. For well, me. So, so as I see it, because you're seldom excluding your will totally. Your will is acting, but it's yeah, yeah, sure. but it's accepting okay. a, a less than dominant position. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it's still it's still there. Yeah, yeah. And, and calculating, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other the other phrase that I would I would never use, <laughs> unless I felt I really had to, is, is substantial moral content independent reasons. Which part of that do you not like? Hardly any of it. <laughs> Hardly any of it, because. 
the, the, the rough translation that I think I reached in my own head was, um, in my calculations, am I taking into account what other people think? Yeah, or what they, what not, they or, ask or am do. I not? Right? Yeah, and, and to me that just seems a better description because independent. Now that I agree with that. I, I, so <laughs> th that moniker or that label, that's Hart's label, and I think it marks a really important insight. I wish he had not used that word. It, I think yeah. it's generated all kinds of confusion. To my mind, what it marks is the fact that someone says do something is a reason to do it. Yeah. And uh, to, 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 yeah, giving it that label causes problems. Yeah, and, and likewise, opinion. content. Like, what's content, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> uh, David um, Enoch uses the term robust reasons for what I think is the same yeah. idea. I, I probably like that term better. Anyway, that, that's, that's the preliminary stuff. Like, like the, the examples that I've been playing around with in my head are, you know, as, as to what, you know, collectively given rules are, are binding. Uh, you know, the murder and, and the pro even the property rules aren't very helpful. Yeah. Um, to, to my mind, the, the more interesting example are, are the highway traffic rules. Okay. Um, um, where, you know, like generally driving on the wrong side of the road, right? You'd, yep. you, people hardly ever do, would do that on a yeah. 400 series highway unless yeah. there was some kind of impairment. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas late at night, yeah. Um, I'm thinking, yeah. uh, since we, we have some Hamilton people here, I was thinking yeah. uh, that little mall on, on Dundurn between King and Main, yeah. you know, where there's one exit from that little yeah, mall. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I can imagine people late, late night yeah. thinking, I'm going to save myself a whole lot of time and trouble if I just yep. drive down the wrong Yep, 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 ways, yep. Right? yep. But, that, but that's an example where people generally obey the which side of the street they drive on. But the one that people like, frequently ignore totally is yeah. how how fast should I be driving on this yeah, strip of yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it's that calculate that, that illustrates why the you know the, the non-subtle versions of, of how the wheel acts. Yeah. It, it really highlights that yeah. problem. Right? Yeah. Because how fast am I going to drive on this highway? I mean, it, it comes from the same authority as the thing you can understand on the street you drive. Yeah, yeah. It comes from the Ontario legislature. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, but people, pe people are, are constantly doing calculations about how yep. fast am I going to drive. I yep. know that nobody yep. enforces 100 kilometers yep. on a 400 series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I know that most enforcement officers aren't even going to be present. Yeah. Um, there's lots of reasons why people will, will use to justify why they're, they're not yep. even going to consider driving 30 kilometers no matter what the signs say. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so, so yet, but it, but this illustrates that in those situations, right, the legitimacy of the Ontario legislature is almost the last thing that's in anybody's mind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but that the calculations that they make, just as yeah. a practical matter, are very, very yeah. subtle. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. <laughs> I think I'd agree with all of that. Uh, yeah. You know, one thing I would mention is the uh, is, is basically just repeat what I said to Fritz Law a while ago, which is. There's nothing in this theory that says that authority, that the, any legislature or government has the scope of authority that it might claim. I, mean, I personally would think that the various reasons that ground the morally mandatory public settlement probably run out at four o'clock in the morning on, you know, uh, uh, at Hamilton, at Dundurn in York. Uh, and there's nothing, I did anything wrong by you know, taking that right turn when I wasn't supposed to, according to the sign. Oh, it's battery died. I think, I think I need to just give it a good shake. <laughs> a good shake? <laughs> Sometimes the bottom is enough. I'll just pass another microphone to you. Yeah, we can change this one. Yeah. 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 Did you use the term collective? I did use the term collective. So how does this arise on your account? Because Presumably, your account works even in non-democratic setting, right? Yes. So you seem to derive from, from 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 the fact that one ought to defer to this will, then this will becomes the will of the collective. So it's a highly yeah. uh, normative conception of a collective will. Well, you could so you could run it both ways. It's the will for the collective, but not necessarily the will of the collective, is uh, it? There, yeah. Uh, so or, or or if you buy the Kantian story, that everybody hypothetically consents to this, then maybe no, it's, no, 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 okay. no, not like that. Uh, so I use the term collective will, and all I mean by that is that there is a you know some sort of, in some domain there's a set of rules that, 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 in some domain there's a public settlement there's a set of rules that everyone's observing and everyone's mutually aware that everyone in this group is observing those rules, and there's nothing more robust or spooky about a collective will so than that. There's no metaphysical claim. No, absolutely not. And I, but I think Roz's story and my story 
both deliver a collective will of the sort that I just described. Right. Uh, okay. And just another clarification. So you, you talk about various accounts at the beginning, and some of these accounts don't focus so much on authority as on coercion. Right? And you sometimes bring in coercion when you say, well, yeah, so we want to have a, a kind of account of authority that talks about dutiful obedience uh, yeah. as the core kind of account yeah. uh, in order to avoid yeah. having resort to too much yeah. coercion. It's great to be able to have that. Yeah, that's that what station. authority that's, does. Okay. Yeah. So so where does coercion fit on the account? Yeah. Does your account speak to coercion at all or just uh, yeah. basically puts it aside as this kind of secondary? Yeah, it's not sort a, of a backstop, key consideration yeah. for okay. political authority. Though, as it happens, uh, there are n networks of rights and rules right. that constitute the application of coercive force. Right. And that may or may not be justified. Well, it's justified if it's, yeah. you know, in, in, in the way that I suggest any collective will. And do you think all these people who speak to the simple view as uh, being targeting authority in the way that you understand it as opposed to coercion? The, the simple view folks, right. when they talk about authority, Right. The simple view folks will also talk about political legitimacy, and they'll distinguish that so, from oh, authority. Uh, so, so that's the like justification, the, authority, justification, legitimacy. Yeah, that you made, they so. will justify. You know, they'll, they'll they'll offer accounts of the grounds of coercion and the prescription of duties, mm -hmm. and they'll distinguish that from this other normative property, which is uh, a, a relationship of political authority mm -hmm. or political obligations. If I to use that term. So, but your account doesn't purport to give us anything on coercion over and beyond the fact that, that that's, that's the back, right. backdrop against which we that's might right. have a second, that's a right. further set of questions. That, that's okay. right. That's right. It, it would be, yeah, whatever scheme of rights and duties that creates a course of collective will, you could ask the same sort of questions right. about it. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. Um, this is just a tiny, Tiny follow-up question. Um, so when when you have the uh, um, the second part of your normal functionist justification thesis, yeah. the political institutions uh, better than any alternative feasible modality. Yeah, I wouldn't like. Wouldn't you say that at least normally coercion figures into that somewhat because you say that that into which one are the feasible modalities has to figure at some point whether they can actually force people to do yeah. what they say. Yeah. So my thought is that there, coercion might be part of that story and it might not. But to be a feasible modality, it just has to somehow have the ability to get people to go along you know, with its directives uh, for, for whatever reason uh, that's possible. Uh, it might be fear. Uh, it might be uh, moral suasion. It could be all kinds of things. Uh, uh, when we're, and now, as a matter of fact, yeah, there's going to be that component. Another question. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm not quite convinced yet that we should move away from the dyadic no. individualist model. No. Um, the one reason being that it seems to be a better, I guess, a better descriptive explanation of the phenomena. Right? So we think about the application of law. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it's true that there are circumstances in which uh, a group, or you might want to say a collective yeah. of individuals, are yeah. arrested, detained, and the laws applied against something about yeah. protests where you know police just sort of take, yeah. a, take a bunch of people. Um, but see, I mean, even in those cases, though, uh, the law applies to individuals, yep. no, right? That, so if you're, you know, if you find yourself before a court who yeah. is going to render judgment on your actions, your behavior, uh, its actions, its norms applied to individuals. Uh, if you're pulled over, if you're if you're if you happen to be unluckily caught uh, making that turn at four o'clock in the morning, and you're you're pulled over, yeah, um, it's an individual. As an individual, the law is being applied yeah. to you. Um, and I think in those cases, there, there's interesting grounds for for challenging Raz's idea that law yeah. necessarily claims authority. And what if the officer decides to entertain your reasons? Like, hey, look, Mr. Police Officer, it's Mrs. Police Officer, look, it's four o'clock in the morning. Um, there's nobody else around. Yeah, and they right? yeah. Here's some here's some first order reasons, and maybe they no. they're persuaded. So those are cases in which I think empirically it looks like the law has not made its claim to authority in that yeah. instance, at least in the application. Yeah. But in most cases, right in the phenomenon, it seems like the law is applying to to individuals, and in that application, you can ask, well, does the law have authority over this individual or, or, or yeah. not? Um, I guess for those reasons, it looks like the, the individualist yeah. model has a, yeah, yeah. Has a well, kind of hold. I, I, yeah. Perhaps I should be clear about the sense in which I think the, the collectivist model is not individualistic. 
I mean, certainly the collectivist model is going to give specific individuals in the public reasons. And that's a key. It gives them substantial moral content independent reasons that trump everybody else's directives. So, it w so the idea is that it does give each individual reasons. The sense in which it's collectivist is that the point I want to make, I'm going to put this metaphorically, but I, hopefully it will resonate. The authority is, when it's a justified authority, it's not justified in replacing your individual will or judgment. Rather, it's justified in specifying the, co the collective will for all of us. But that does not entail uh, excluding or replacing any particular person's judgment. So, so another way to, you know, to, use the, to use this frontispiece again, uh, the idea is that uh, an authority is a, when you have an authority, you have a collective will. And that's one level of analysis. Like there's this group that's, uh, that you could say is all observing. The group as a whole is observing some set of rights and duties, right? Uh, now, on Roz's account, uh, he wants to give an account of how that happens using individual building blocks by excluding and replacing the wills of, you know, the uh, of particular individuals in the group. And what I want to say is, well, you know, you don't need that part of the story. It might happen that way sometimes, but that's not an important or, uh, uh, or, or a necessary element of the story. That you can play the deliberative role for the group as a whole without playing it for each individual member of the group. I wonder if the, if the objection I have is, is tied to the, the idea of fragmentation or piecemeal uh, view of authority. Yeah. Um, and one thing that this gets you yeah. is you don't get fragmentation. Basically, you're just not in the group. You're not part of the Leviathan. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'm still attracted to the, the fragmentation part of this. Yeah. As you can. Uh, Will and then Daniel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm having a hard time grasping what's distinctive about your view yeah. as opposed to Raz's. So, sure. um, let's let's take the case of Jeremy. Yeah. I suppose he's the yeah. expert on property. He knows more than anybody else, yeah. including the government. Yeah. Now, does he satisfy your collectivist conception of political authority? Yeah. It seems. Are he, well, he, well, well it seems to me he would. All right. Oh, he? Yeah. yeah. So uh, just read what you say here. Yeah. Uh, he's got authority over the group. If there's a non-empty set of directives such that should, should, a, should Jeremy issue any of them for each member G, the directive would be a substantial moral content independent reason to act as directed based upon his superior expertise. Yeah. And the substantial moral content independent force of the directive would both defeat without being defeated, the substantial blah, blah, blah. Yeah. for any countervailing directors. So given that his expertise is there, yeah. why wouldn't yeah. he have authority? And if that's, yeah. uh, yeah. if that's the case, then you've got a kind of a piecemeal yeah. thing going on there as well. Okay, so now the question is not whether he's subject to authority. Now the worry is that, well, based on my account, he is an authority. And I, oh, no, I don't think so. No, because he's not, is Katarina's reasons. And, and those are my reasons too. Uh, and he's not even. I mean, what he can't do, he, he's not. A, he would not be a very good uh, modality because no one's going to do what Jeremy says. <laughs> does, does that mean that the epistemic account of authority? Or, this is not an epistemic account of authority. It's a practical account of authority. It, and, and for us, both of them kind of coalesce, but for you, they don't. Right. So, so Jeremy yeah. would be an epistemic authority. He, he, so what he can't do is he doesn't have the capacity to secure conformity of the group. He can't do that. Uh, he, uh, let's, uh, so yeah, so there's, there's no, there, there, it, because he can't do that, he can't discharge this function. And so there's no ground uh, of his directives that sets him, uh, you know, sets him above everybody else's. Now your, your thought is that he's an expert yeah. and he knows better than everybody's else. 
Right. And, and then my response is that... If I can't rest, I just don't think. Oh, wait. No, I, I, about Jeremy. Yeah. Well, well he's, he's coming at it from a different because directive. My, because my individual reasons won't, <coughs> yeah. won't, be, won't be such as I would, uh, that I should defer to Jeremy because the whole point of having property is that we have a collective enterprise and so on and so forth. So he won't be authoritative either. Well, he won't. Uh, no, no, that, but that wasn't my criticism. My criticism is that on Roz's account, Jeremy would not be bound by the authority of the state because of his superior expertise. And I think that's the perverse implication. If we, that's the, the, if we assume that the institution is the best modality of securing and specifying. So on your account, he would be. On, uh, yes, he would be bound because... Uh, well, well, well he, he, he would be bound by the authorities' directives because the authority satisfies this NFJT. The authority is the best modality available for all of us. It's a collective modality. And that's the key point that I, I'm trying to make. The question is whether, so, so there would be these deliberative or epistemic considerations, but who you compete with is other viable modalities. You don't compete with individuals. Does that make sense? Uh, or, or I don't know. Uh, that's, that, that's the idea. You don't compete with Jeremy Waldron. You compete with some other potential de facto authority. Well, it turns out that he, that he, he was able to yeah. generate yep. cooperation because of charismatic yep. or something like that. Then you'd have a question. Then you'd have a question. But I think this so is this useful. Is, would, so is your account, your account not restricted to institutions? No? Oh, that's right. Custom is one of the modalities you have to compete with. Is it better for you to do it or for this regime to emerge out of custom? Is that deliberatively, does it deliver better, uh, better outcomes? Uh, yeah, yeah, but that is the key. And that's why I want to hold the NF, my, my functional justification thesis, I want to sit there and compare it with Roz's because Roz's, you know, to get authority, you have to show that you are better than the individual with respect to the reasons. On my account, no, you just have to show that it's better for the institution or the modality, whatever it might be, to set the collective will. So, okay, so now I'm going to actually uh, be more concrete. And I, I so two two questions. One, um, you, um, so so your account is presented as, as general, but it's actually. Um, Quite limited in the in the following way that it's uh, it deals with political authorities. Raz, one of the things that he thought was the strength of his yeah. account was that it was completely general in the sense that it it encapsulated or captured also the authority of the expert on you know the Big Bang theory that we could yeah. ask him or her and yeah. they would they have authority over on this question. Yeah. And that question has nothing collective about it. There yeah. may be just one, one person. So, so and, and that, going back to my previous question, yeah. shows that you are already have an, a, an account of, pol an, of political authority as opposed to his account that captures, yeah. at least in principle, or he th planned it to capture theoretical yeah. authority. And so, so that's one sense in which, in which I could perhaps re sure. return to my earlier question of saying, you know, you, sh you should perhaps be more open about the fact that you have a political theory here. The second one is very concrete about your second condition um, in the NFJT. So the normal way to establish an institution as, as collectivist political authority includes that all things considered the political institution issuance of those directives is better than any alternative feasible. Yeah. Um, it, this is either extremely easy to satisfy or almost impossible to satisfy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. So, I agree. so um, I mean, I you know, agree get, take, take American, um, American um, yeah. structure of the American polity. Couldn't you say that we can imagine better um, modalities for that group? Yeah. I mean, you know, complaints about the, the dysfunction of yeah. American politics is yeah. you probably know this better than me. Yeah. Um, so it, 
if, if that's the case, you would say it's very easily satisfied and you would have to say that there is no uh, way that the American politics can yeah. even establish yeah. Uh, yeah. a political authority. Yeah. Um, or it, you, you, you'd kind of say feasible. And in this context, it's in unfeasible yeah. to change it. And then it's extremely easy to satisfy because you will always be able yeah. to say within the confines of what we have now, there's no yeah. other feasible alternative. So. Yeah, good. I, I mean, I think that is a key point. And this is something that I'm trying to make clear. And I think there is room, like a middle ground between those things. And, and you know, trying to articulate that. Uh, is an important task that I haven't fully discharged. Uh, now that said, okay, by feasible, yeah, I do mean something like there's some sort of, you know, latent capacity to organize this collective will uh, uh, in some other way. And it can't be, you know, uh, it, 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 it's not that the institution has to exist, but that would help, but it has to be something that would happen fairly quickly to be feasible. Uh, that that's the idea. Now, do I think that can be satisfied? Yeah, I do think that happens because what happens a lot is so. For example, uh, in the 15th century, a court of chancery developed. You got an, a new institution that sort of started issuing directives, and then like, okay, this this is now feasible. Uh, uh, another possibility would be so you have a secessionist movement, right? And you have pretty clearly defined boundaries uh, and even some, you know, some administrative lines that you know, already exist where those folks could start governing themselves pretty quickly. Well, now you have a feasible alternative modality. Uh, uh, but it, but it, so there, you know, the, the real important question is these borderline cases. Another one, so the uh, European, the European Court of Human Rights, there's this real question whether it should settle disputes about the public settlement of rights, human rights in, in, in member states. Uh, that's a fee I would say that's a feasible modality in the relevant sense, admitting I need to get clearer uh, on these terms. Uh, but the idea would be, yeah, that's a feasible modality. And now the question is, is it all things considered better to have it authoritatively settle these issues? Or is, it, or is there some sort of division of authoritative labor that would make sense? Uh, uh, that's the idea. Now, one real virtue, I think, of this account is I think this account gives a lot better guidance to judges than it would give to Van Raz's account. Because on, the idea is that, look, judges should, one thing they should do is look for the authoritative norms. Now, on Raz's account, the authoritative norms is going to be described in terms of those norms that give exclusionary reasons. That's a really hard question to answer because for, on Raz's account, uh, uh, authorities fragmented. And I don't even know how to begin to answer that question for a judge, uh, you know, whether this norm is authoritative. On my account, I think it's easy to answer the question, is that the best modality for settling this dispute, dispute in this community? If it is, that's the norm I have to apply. That's how this story links to the defense of non-positivism. Pass the microphone, Danny, to your right. No, that's my microphone. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Well, I was just doing a little brainstorming in my head, think, thinking about alternative feasible mobilities, and I, I was just trying to think of some examples. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a really good one right off the top of my head, but I think I could probably find one. Because um, there are some areas um, in, in, the, in, in corporate practice that are you know, very esoteric, where, where there's a real community of practice that's a rel relatively small and tight community. Mm -hmm. And in the, the, the rare occasions a dispute will, will escape to the courts. And the Supreme Court of Canada will issue a judgment, but that community basically ignores it because they say that they're not the experts in this area. I, I, th I think you could actually find cases of that phenomenon where there's a where there's a tight professional community that basically will ignore even a Supreme Court of Canada decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then the other one that comes to mind is probably. Um, some of the family arbitration yep. communities are, are probably like regularly ignoring yep. the, the, the yep. recent Ontario yeah. legislation that, yeah. that invalidates yeah. it all. Yeah. Um, and they're probably yeah. able to do it yeah. fairly consistently, except for the odd case that yeah. escapes. Yeah. 
Uh, I think an interesting question is the reverse, which is what authority should, uh, say, the courts in Canada accord to these various informal uh, dispute settlers? Uh, and you could ask that question over, over and over again. Administrative tribunals, uh, you know, human rights, uh, you know, th th those little committees that, uh, 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 th that uh, you have in Canada to settle, you know, particular disputes. Well, yeah, but it, 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 it's back to the Highway Traffic Act for me because it's like everybody knows that if, if you're ticketed for driving 105 on the 401, you're probably going to end up paying the fine if it goes to court. But you're reasonably sure that the Ontario government is not very, very serious about 105 on the 401. Yeah. You know, that the, the odds of that are sufficiently yeah. slim that it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good calculation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that even the police community regularly is seen ignoring that yeah. particular yeah. law. So it's a... Thanks. I find it hard to let go of the more individualistic focus in RAS. Another way in which it takes roots into his account is this autonomy or independence conditions that he attaches to the normal justification thesis, mm -hmm. right? So, so when we're asking, well, um, or when we have the intuition, authority should just not be there, right? Mm -hmm. Authority should just not tell me who I should get married to. Mm -hmm. Authority should not just not yeah. tell me who, where I should travel. Yeah. Is there a feature like this in your account that yeah. underlies yeah. Uh, everything? Yeah. So, so that's also there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so, but we, we, because you can imagine a situation where, given the choice that I've made in yeah. my life, yeah. certain kinds of decisions, yeah. which in general for other people would not be a question of autonomy or a question yeah. of autonomy for me, yeah. right? And some of these questions might be highly political yeah. decisions. And so that yeah. make might make certain considerations more. Yeah. Uh, it might be more important for me not to have to deal with authority on those questions as for yeah. the rest. Does that mean that the authority yeah. then yeah. Uh, has a different standing vis-a-vis -vis yeah. me? There's there's two different. No, when just. It wouldn't just be me. Uh, well, maybe we can talk about okay. that. But at least let me give you the first right. cut. First cut is that, first of all, we have to have a domain where we need a morally mandatory public settlement. That's the first question. You know, maybe, you know, about religion? Maybe we don't. Or maybe, you know, we just had a bunch of wars. Maybe we do. <laughs> uh, so that's the first question. Second question is, is the settlement so egregious that my reasons to follow the public settlement are defeated? Now we're outside of the authority as well. Right. So th those are, you know, those are two things. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I don't know if I can frame the second bit more precisely at this point. But one might think that what it is valuable for me to do for reasons of autonomy might not be the same thing that are valuable for you, right? And in the political sphere, yeah. there might be certain situations where for me, yeah. It's hard for me to conceive. Maybe I can just come back to it if I yeah. can, can muster an example. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm wondering if, because yeah. I, I, I find it hard to untether these two ideas of valuing autonomy so strongly that it determines the scope of autonomy, and then you simply letting go of it when you're then yeah. assessing yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, the preemptive character yeah. of the authority. So Here's one yeah. way that autonomy doesn't fit in, and this is why it's such a big deal for Ross. Right. I mean, Roz is saying the authority's directive should exclude and replace your own judgment. Right. Now we have real concerns about autonomy. Like, is there something slavish about this? There's something, some duty of autonomy that I'm violating. On my accounts... Well, Roz says, you don't do this, right? There's always the question of whether you should surrender yep. your, your will, which you always yep, don't yep, ask yep. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, he, but that question doesn't come up in the same way on the collectivist account. And you, you have an authority relationship where you're never asked to give up your judgment. Uh, and so it, it doesn't come up. Similar issues might come up. There might be a public settlement that intrudes on your autonomy, but that's different. Time for one more question. Mr. Will? All right. <clears throat> this may be a totally unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. All right, um, <laughs> favorite kind. Uh, I think Danny brought this up. That one of the appeals of the Razian theory is that it applies to political authority and other kinds of authority. Yeah. So I was just curious whether, whether you see your account yeah. as uh, yeah. uh, is, how it could be extended to incorporate things like military authority yeah. or yeah. parental authority or things of yeah. that kind, or, or whether it's yeah. just, just totally yeah. separate and. Uh, yeah. 
I think that's a real question. And I feel like here's where I think you should let the social phenomenon drive the answer. Uh, I have good company here. Locke thought that political authority and parental authority were very different beasts. Uh, it could be that political authority is very different <laughs> than pro parental authority. I'm not sure about that, but that's a possibility. Um, but anyway, I, I think it would, be, it would be considerations like that that would, uh, that would drive the answer to that question. I do not think that a unified account in itself is a good thing. R rather, the unified account is a good thing if it captures something that really is similar across all these kinds of relationships. Now, I would say that if you look at a lot of authority relationships amongst adults, say a basketball team, uh, I, I use this example in an, in an old version of this paper. You know, every single professional basketball player on a basketball team, uh, you could make an argument that there's no reason to exclude and replace, <laughs> you know, your judgment with that person's judgment. But there is an argument to say, look, someone's got to call the shots. We all have equal claim to. We got to just settle on someone. This is the best someone to do it. I feel like that might be a... Uh, a more realistic account of, of both the phenomenon and the way we ground it. We don't look for reasons for the coach to exclude and uh, replace my will. We just look for reasons to follow the coach's plan as opposed to anyone else's plan. That's kind of a collectivist authority. Yeah, that, right? yeah, I would so think that there, I think there'd be a lot of instances where you have something that looks a lot more. I, I, I don't need to make any commitments like that, but I do think that there are some that would look like that, certainly, you know, and I would raise that as one potential example. But once again, I think the phenomena should drive, you know, the account of the structure of the relationship. Uh, and, and it does seem to me that between competent adults, like a situation like that, or a department, you know, we don't think the chair, <laughs> there's any reason to exclude and replace our, you know, our judgment. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but, I, but, but, but I do think my directives will be overweening substantial moral content independence. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I know that. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me.